the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary. Lord, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Blessed are thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for our sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So good morning, everyone. Good morning. How's life? Wonderful. <laughs> that film was very good. How many of you have ever been to Fatima? And it is so good to be there. And it's a wonderful place, you know, for prayer and also you know to see the uh, the places where Mary appeared, where the angel appeared to the children, and many many other things. So it's so wonderful. But you know, there are some little details that um, I had never basically heard before I went there, you know, hear the story. Like you heard about the, uh, the angel coming with a chalice and a toast, and then prostrating himself and basically teaching the kids the prayer. Well, when that happened, because there was a nearby church, so Christy didn't know, but he went and a chalice was missing his church and the horse was missing and he was like what did I do? So he didn't know what happened until many years later when Lucia told the story that you know the angel appeared with the chalice and the horse then the priest connected that on that same, on that same day the chalice went missing and the host. Okay, so the angel stole from the church. <laughs> <laughs> but it was very, it was very interesting, you know, to see that you know there was that even connection there. Did the chalice come Yes, it went back. The angel returns stolen from. <laughs> yeah, the chalice went back. Okay. So, but it is uh, just amazing, you know the. Uh, like when you are in a also called in a secular world, you think that oh maybe the faith is dying out, you know, whatever. But when you go to places like Fatima, you come to the recognition that basically humanity is yearning for direction, for guidance. Okay? And people love their faith and the Holy Spirit is at work. I mean every day, and you know at night there is a rosary at 9.30. And on average, at least to the days we were there, and they told us that it's more or less, you know, like that all year. Maybe winter time it changes a little bit. But it's almost 2,000 people every night for that rosary and the procession. Sunday, the Sunday where there's almost 8,000 people who come there every night. You know, that is our only goal. There is basically you got praying of the rosary, the liturgy is mass going on every day. And um, it was so it just it's just a, it's just amazing. So confessions are going on almost all the time. There's an underground whatever, you know, chapels. Okay? Confessions are going on all the time. So it's just a, the faith is alive. Like, you know, when I was there, you know, in the confessions and I went to go to confession, you get down there, there were so many people, and so people were in line were asking me, do you speak English? I said, yes, well, hear my confession. <laughs> <laughs> so I was, I was hearing, you know, illegal confession, I don't know what it is. Because, you know, you hear the confessionals, but people want to believe it. No way. So it was a Sunday, so I had confessions there. Then I get back in line also to go to confession. But then when I was just there waiting, well, there was a young girl, I think she was maybe like 18, 19. You know, she came out of the confessional. There's a, a statue of Mary there, an image of Mary there. And this girl, you know, you know how Muslims pray? Okay, they go down. So this girl prostrated herself before the image of Mary for like 20 minutes. She was just there like that, motionless. So that gives you, you know, an understanding okay, that the faith is alive. Okay, people love their faith. 
So these are people who here say, oh, the faith is dwindling, you know, people no longer care about their faith, you know. All that is uh, the devil's ploy to make us discouraged, to give up. But you know, when you go to places like that, you see that you know, the faith is very much alive. So there's no room for discouragement and giving up. You see that also with Lourdes? Yeah, I mean, we are, we are talking about only Fatima, but Lourdes, okay. Major Gori, when I went there, it was a lot of there. But I think Major Gori, I think some of you who went with me to Major Gori? Nobody here. Who has ever been to Major Gori? No, I've been. Yeah, ever, ever. You've been no, there. Okay. So I think, you know, when I went to Medjugorje, you know, the Pope said something yesterday, which probably is a hint to the kind of decision they're going to make about Medjugorje. So when I went to Medjugorje, you know, the Francis, there is a fight, a constant fight between the Franciscans and the diocesan priests. And so I was wondering what it was. Because we are going to hear about Major Gori very soon. The Pope is going back to me to make a decision, so maybe we need to have some background. So when I went there, I asked what the controversy is about. So I was told that the, when the Muslims conquered basically Yugoslavia, that area when it was still Yugoslavia, so the, basically the so-called diocesan priests like us abandoned the people. But the Franciscans stayed and went underground. And so they ministered to the people for over 100 years, the underground, like an underground church. So the people trusted them because they stayed with them. Okay? They endured whatever it was with them. So that is the, so the people love the Franciscans and they don't trust the diocesan priest. But it is the best of the diocesan bishop who has to make decisions about different things. So that was there. So when I went there, the Franciscans, you know, prepare the liturgies very well. So there's no heresy talk there. Okay, the liturgies are well. People pray. Confessions are going on all the time. There are conversions there. But when it came to the visionaries, okay, I went there. You know, and I saw them. And then you hear them say that Mary promised that she will appear to them every day for the rest of their lives. Okay, that is, you know, I, I'm not saying it can't happen, but it's very questionable. Okay? And every day she has a particular time when she comes to give a message. Every day. So what kind of message that is? I'm not saying it can't happen, but it raises questions. Okay? So all these uh, visionaries have been there, like I, Ivan, he has, he has even been to Las Vegas here when I was still at St. Elizabeth. He came there. But the claim is Mary appears to him every day, which means that there have been apparitions in Las Vegas because Mary appears to him every day. So what, why would Mary follow these people whenever they go? What is the message that Mary offers every day? Every day. So is it necessary? So those are the questions I think uh, Rome is looking into. And probably the decision most likely is going to be that it's not true. What is going on there? Most likely. Because of what the Pope already said. I don't, uh, I don't have the quote with him. Maybe I can bring it down to break what he said. It was like a hint. Okay? that uh, it's a kind of uh, innovation, that's not how Catholics believe. It was basically saying to that effect. Okay? Again, focusing on those so-called daily apparitions at a particular time all your life. You know, it's very questionable. Okay. Do you think there's some chance that the original apparition was, was authentic, but it's been misinterpreted by the visionaries? Somewhere along the way? Usually, usually, I don't, I mean, it can happen that way, but usually, if it is authentic, usually the Holy Spirit makes sure that He guides it. If it is authentic. So the Holy Spirit will guide it through His church. 
I mean, you, you really look at what happened in, uh, here in Mexico, where in uh, Guadalupe, eh? they, they didn't believe, no? we, we, you know, one to, to begin with, it. but the Holy Spirit guided okay? Fatima is the same thing, Lourdes is the same thing. Okay, so if it is authentic, the Holy Spirit finds a way to, to guide it. Every day. Every day. So I was there. And uh, sometimes you notice it's like uh, there's, there's something that, that doesn't feel right about the visionaries. I saw them. But I didn't, uh, I wasn't very comfortable. Remember I told you about a girl in Hollywood who was claiming to have uh, visions, but you know she was in these high heels, you know, walking cattle with body bodyguards around her, <laughs> coming to deliver the messages. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> something has that celebrity kind of uh, surroundings, then it's uh, So I think um, the Pope will declare Major Gori maybe that it's not uh, But uh, I think they, uh, I don't know how they're going to do it, because the place itself has produced so many conversions, genuine conversions. And Pope John Paul said, if good things are happening there, okay, so, so for me when I say it's a good place for prayer. Okay, I'm, I'm from Chicago, and I was raised in the, the Sacred Heart Croatian Church. The priests and nuns that are at the Sacred Heart Croatian Church, that's just one church of a group of Croatian churches in that area, okay? These are the nuns and priests from Medjugorje. So early on, when all this stuff was beginning, and when they were traveling to the United States, they would come to our church. And so they would, the visionaries would be in our church. Of course, I wasn't there at the time. By this time, I moved away from home. But my sisters were, were in church, and they were right next to the visionaries, OK? And, uh, What's, one of the things that's supposed to happen is that at the end of all of this stuff, whatever, the, if, I, if I got the message right, something is supposed to happen in Medjugorje that will be permanent, that everybody in the world would be able to see this thing, and it will be kind of an untouchable thing. I can't imagine what it could be. You know, maybe they're going to drop an atomic bomb that won't go off. Or something. <laughs> yes. Something is yeah, but the thing is, like when you hear some of the messages, like you can't be cut off what Fatima was, and so it's, it's just a, it's a, so we, let's wait for the Pope. <laughs> yeah, but he gave a hint already, so we'll, we'll wait and see. Okay? But I know, you know, many people who have been there and involved are going to be disappointed, but remember, that uh, we have to make, by the way, let's uh, talk about this briefly. We have to make a difference. We have to know the difference. The difference between Okay, this is divine, okay, divine revelation, okay? Public divine revelation and what we call private revelations. So public divine revelation is what we call the deposit of faith. This binds in conscience the other pain of mother's sin. Okay? If it is the deposit of faith, public divine revelation, what the church teaches, okay, it binds in conscience. If I obey it, I will be saved. If I disobey it, I will not be saved. So public divine revelation is not a matter of opinions, private opinions. 
that I may believe, I may not believe. You know, some people have a problem with or a misunderstanding about public prime revelation, the way the magisterium teaches it. There's what we call the extra ordinary magisterium, and what we call the ordinary magisterium. Which of these two is binding in conscience? Both. Hmm? Both. Uh, we have to make sure that we understand that both. There has been some confusion, I even heard it on the Madrid Heart Radio, the confusion about these two. As if the ordinary teachings are, you know, there is some leeway okay, about, you know, believing it or not believing it. These ordinary, extraordinary, and ordinary teachings of the magisterium are the deposit of faith. What we mean by ordinary, it means that the Pope has never sat on the chair, in the chair of authority, which we call the cathedra, and basically declared these teachings, okay, you know, defined the teachings. That's the difference. So the extraordinary teachings are those teachings whereby the Pope sat in that chair and defined them. But it doesn't mean that what he did it define it in that extraordinary way is not the truth. Okay, so for example, the Immaculate Conception, the Pope sat in the chair, okay, ex cathedra, and basically defined that teaching. But the Pope, no Pope in the history of the faith, has ever sat in the chair of authority and say that I did hereby declare and define that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. No Pope has ever done that in an extraordinary way. So that does, does that mean that well, we may believe or not believe that Jesus is the Son of God? No. Okay. So the deposit of faith is taught by the chair of Peter, all of the bishops, the magisterium, in both extraordinary and ordinary. But most of the teachings are ordinary. That doesn't mean that they are less okay, true in the hierarchy of truth. Yes, correct. So then what do we do about all these statements that the Pope seems to make offhandedly when he's on airplanes and stuff like that, that seem like they're a little bit towards the periphery of the teachings of the church? No, no, when, when, uh, sometimes when a Pope you know, makes a particular comment here and there, that's why you saw you know, Pope Benedict okay, was a theologian. Okay? When he became Pope, he didn't stop. But he made it very clear in his first book, when he was Pope Jesus of Nazareth, that this is not in any way meant to be a magisterial teaching. Right. Uh, but when you look at what he says there, basically it is church teaching. But to, make, you know, to prevent the confusion that when you read Jesus of Nazareth, that you're reading an official teaching of the church. That's why you had Cantula Mezza, okay? Was it Cantula, no, the Pope, uh, the spokesperson? He's not Cantula Mezza, but he's some, somebody else. Yeah. So when the Pope said something, he said, he came out and said, paper phone calls are not part of the deposit of faith. Okay. If the Pope made a call to someone, and someone claims that the Pope told me this, that's not part of the Okay. The post of faith. All part of the magisterium. Yeah. Okay. Until the Pope makes it clear that this is a magisterial teaching, like when he writes an encyclical. Okay. okay. Encyclicals are looked at as a magisterial teaching. Because it's the Pope basically explaining and propounding the faith of the church. But I guess I don't really so the Pope and the papacy supposed to be the conduit for the Holy Spirit and the church, right? So I don't understand how he can speak, I don't understand how he can be a Pope and speak outside of the positive faith on matters of like telling a married woman or whatever you told whoever and whatever you say, all of that. Like I understand how he could maybe, you know, talk about the weather and be wrong. 
for, you know, have taste in clothing. That is I guess that But I don't understand how he can go about and talk about teachings and Jesus and be outside of the I guess I don't know who advises the Pope with the media in that right. case, okay? That's why you notice that uh, most Popes, okay, they try their best to write yeah. <laughs> something down because it is dangerous, yeah. okay, to do sometimes, you know, because, you know, the media is looking for something, okay? And so, someone who advises him on the media, the Western media, has to know what is going on and probably whoever that is has not been doing a good job. Okay? That you don't come out and say certain things, okay? even within a particular context, if it's not written down. Because someone is going to take a particular part of what you said, like when they take that particular part, when they say, who am I to judge? Okay? Who am I to judge? That's, that's what you hear. The Pope said, who am I to judge? But when you read the whole context, it tells something different. The context is, whoever it is, let's go to the Pope saying, whoever the sinner is, whatever weaknesses you have, if you are doing the will of God, there's no problem. Okay? If you have homosexual tendencies, but if you're not acting on it and you're doing the will of God, basically that's what he was saying in the context. But you never hear that, they took out the sound bite, and the Pope has never come out and, and haven't had anything to clarify that. Okay? Okay? All number two, like again, <coughs> spontaneous kind of speaking, because when you are Pope, basically, whatever comes out of your mouth is considered by people as church teaching, you are the figure of Christ. So when you say that a woman had seven caesarean C-sections, and then she got pregnant again for the eighth, okay? And they asked her, why are you doing that? At least that's what the text that came out said. Why are you doing that? And she said, oh, well, this is my, will be my eighth C-section, but I trusted God. And I told her, no, you are tempting God. All we are not supposed to produce like rabbits. And so, so there is a context in which that can be understood, okay, whereby the church says that it's not right to bring life into the world irresponsibly. We have to be responsible. The church teaches if you can take care of two children, okay, that's why we believe in and accept what we call natural family planning. If you can take care of five, fine. If you can take care of ten, fine. But make sure that you bring life into the world responsibly. Okay? So you should, you could have said it in those uh, church, in line with church teaching. But when you go into producing like rabbits and so on and so forth, that's what people hear. Okay? And then people get angry. But then he qualified that the next day. In Rome, basically, he clarified it, okay, what he said. Okay. But uh, so that's why popes, you know, write things down. Okay, because, you know, it's, it's a very difficult to just say things, and, and of course, as you know, the media is constantly there to get you. Yes. I don't know whether he's aware of that or whether he's aware of that. Pardon? My question is how could he not be aware of this? He's been doing this for over two years. He's been causing confusion and causing a thing. How no, but the thing, is, but the thing is, the thing is also that uh, sometimes you have to be fair to the Pope, okay? In that, there are people who said things he didn't say. That's why it's very important to go, or to, I said, to take some days to go to the official Vatican website and see what he actually said. Because what you hear, Yahoo, whatever, even there are some conservative websites, okay, who said things the Pope didn't say. Okay, because they are catching it from the general media and the Pope never said it. Okay, so it's very important at least to take some days and then go to the official website and see exactly what he said in the full context. Because you remember that the media wants to frame him as a liberal. That's what they want, that he is on their side. 
Okay, they are doing that. Remember when he talked about economics, the economy. Okay? When you read the, his encyclical, okay, it is very clear it's church teaching. But then the so-called liberals, like in MSNBC, took everything over that the Pope was on their side. Basically, the Pope was a Democrat <laughs> and not a Republican. That's how it was presented in the U.S. concerning economics, which is not true at all, because the Pope never did that. The Pope doesn't even know Democrat Republican in the U.S. But the, the, the liberals took him over as a Democrat is on their side. Okay, so, but the Pope never did that when you read the text. It's very clear that he's explaining and expounding church teaching on basically what the church, so, social teachings of the church. That's all he was doing. So we have to, to, to be fair to the Pope that the media wants to frame him, and so we have to be very careful to look into it whether what the media is saying is what he actually said. Okay, now let's go back to our Luther. <laughs> Luther, in the history of uh, the church, and well, whatever, not the church, but the general history, that period is called the Protestant Reformation. Okay, it is referred to as the Protestant Reformation. But when you look at what Luther did, what he did has no element of reform in terms of the faith whatsoever. In other words, he deformed the faith and misled a huge chunk of people, okay, of believers. So, whenever we hear about the reformation, we shouldn't think of it as something that basically reformed the faith from a Protestant point of view. There were true genuine reformers who reformed the church then, but it wasn't Martin Luther or Calvin or Zwingli. Okay? They were within the church. Okay? <clears throat> so we looked at his famous saying, we are saved by faith alone. And we said that scripture doesn't say that. And Luther himself was forced to accept, to acknowledge that what he said is not true because scripture never says it. What does scripture say? We are saved by faith. Just as scripture says we are saved by hope. Just as scripture says we are saved by love or charity. But it never says we are either saved by faith alone and not hope or charity. Or we are saved by hope alone, not faith and charity. Simply says, we are saved by faith. But again, St. Paul continues to explain what a, what faith really is, what a living faith is. It can't be devoid of charity or hope. So the three go together. So Luther invented the alone. Yeah, that word alone is not in scripture. Okay. So let's, uh, then we are, we are at a point whereby you know, what basically is part of Luther, and because many people had already resented what was happening in the church, because it was so much now about money, yeah, and the big structures and whatever, so there was a lot of resentment among the people. So when Luther came, under the guise of criticizing the church on that, many people genuinely followed him. They were basically mm, genuine in what they did not realizing that Luther was basically subverting the mission of the church. But what he was addressing at the time appealed to the people because people were fed up with what was going on. Okay? So that's why money is a constant temptation we have to guard against. Because everything we can be claim to be church, but in actual fact everything is about money and the control. That's why you notice that sometimes money gets more attention than the blessed sacrament. Okay. So money is guarded okay, more than the blessed sacrament. So we have to always be uh, careful. Money is a big temptation, source of temptation. You know um, in the letters of... Um, let's just look at that. I think I'll find it. Yeah. 
what is the letter of uh, first letter of Timothy? Hmm? Let's go to Timothy. Money, we love it, it is a very resourceful, it helps us, but it is very, very dangerous. Okay, so we go. Um, what did I say? Where it is? <laughs> did I say what Timothy? desires a noble task. Therefore, a bishop must be irreproachable, married only once. Okay? You know, they, because you know that marriage and the priesthood are not mutually exclusive. Like in the Eastern rites, you know, priests get married, but not bishops. Okay? But okay. <laughs> when we went to Medjugorje, we saw those, you know, priests came with their married, you know, girls in like jeans and whatever. And the people I went with were so mad at these girls. <laughs> okay? So you've been married only once, temperate, self-controlled, decent, hospitable, able to teach. Because his ministry is to teach. So you can't be bishop and not teach. Able to teach, not a drunkard. Okay? No boozing. <laughs> Not aggressive. Okay? Because a bishop must be gentle. A shepherd must be gentle. Not aggressive, but gentle. Not contentious. Not a lover of money. You see that? 
said, pardon? Um, chapter 3 of First Timothy, and that is verse 4. Okay? First Timothy chapter 3. Okay, that's where we are. Okay? Not a lover of money. Okay? And uh, basically he also continues to Okay, okay, so again continue to listen to this. He must manage his own household well, keeping his children under control with perfect dignity. For if a man does not know how to manage his own household, how can he take care of the church of God? <coughs> you know, at home we have a saying, you know, because you know, at home we have so many priests, like you know, so many. But then, you know, we, we look among ourselves and you see a particular, you know, man, a priest. And, you know, priests, you know, say, you know, covertly, covertly, they say, you know, God, God, God saved the women from that man. <laughs> God, you know, there are certain people you look at and say that if that man were married, how would his home be like? You know, they are mean, they are and social, you know, whatever, so it's like, hmm? so how can he take care of his, if you can't take care of your ha household, how can you take care of the household of God? He should not be a recent convert, so that he may not become considered and thus incur the devil's punishment. He must also have a good reputation among outsiders, so that he may not fall into disgrace, the devil's trap. So he continues now. All this applies to bishops, you know, priests and deacons. Similarly, deacons must be dignified, not deceitful. Because you can't, you can't be a minister of truth and at the same time lie. Not addicted to drink. You see, drinking and money. Okay? It's, <laughs> it's not a recent problem. It's a constant problem. Drinking, not greedy for sordid gain, holding fast to the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. Moreover, they should be tested first, then if there is nothing against them, let them serve as deacons. Okay? And so on and so forth. So, that is where, and there is another text, you know, where he talks about the dangers of money and so on and so forth when he's giving, you know, counsel to Timothy in, in other parts of the letter. But at least start to, uh, to make sure that, uh, you know, we must always avoid greed, because once we give in to greed, then we lose sight of love, charity. And when we lose sight of charity, we have lost sight of God, God who is love. So that is the danger of greed. Okay? Greed is contrary to charity. And once I lose sight of charity, I have lost the sight of God. Not that we can't use money well, but if it becomes the center of life, this kind of thing, you know, money talks, okay? then we know that we are in danger. And that's what basically created some of these problems we are going to look at. So for a long time, it had been customary for the popes to grant indulgences for buildings of public utility. And that's how many of the big churches were built, okay? which is not bad, okay? but we are going to look at the method. In such cases, the true doctrine of indulgences as a remission of the punishment due to sin, not of guilt of sin, had been always have always been upheld and the necessary conditions, that is especially the obligation to of a contrite confession to obtain absolution from sin, always inculcated. So indulgences, what are they? <coughs> what are indulgences? I, um, it is very, very sad okay, that I had a Catholic bishop, or rather a Catholic priest, telling all, let's say, in ridiculing indulgences. 
you know that uh, some of uh, some people are just like uh, you know sometimes more Protestant than Protestants. Mm -hmm. So let's go to Article fourteen seventy one. You have the Catechism fourteen seventy one. It's very important for us you know, to understand the church's teaching on indulgences. Let's just go through these uh, um, texts. Because of these abuses of indulgences, basically some people went as far as saying that we don't need indulgences. But we have to remember that any gift God has given to us has been abused by us humans. So it doesn't mean that the gift is bad, therefore we have to get rid of it. Okay? How often do we abuse the gift of intelligence, intellect? But we say that, well, we don't need it because we abuse it. No, because some of us use it well, others abuse it. So, indulgences, listen to this. The doctrine and the practice of indulgences in the church are closely linked to the effects of the sacrament of penance, reconciliation. What is an indulgence? An indulgence is a remission before God of the temporal punishment due to sins whose guilt has already been forgiven, which the faithful Christian who is duly disposed gains under certain prescribed conditions through the action of the church, which as the minister of redemption dispenses and applies with authority the treasury of the satisfactions of Christ and the saints. Now that's a loaded theological statement. <coughs> okay? So basically, it is this that when we go to, when we commit sins, we said this before, we incur two kinds of punishments. If it's mortal sin, we incur what we call eternal punishment, which we call hell. Okay? But also, our sins incur what we call temporal punishment. Okay? For example, if I happen to kill Horace, he has eight children. Okay? His children are hungry, probably they have no shelter, which means that even if I go to confession, and the eternal punishment is cancelled, I will not go to hell, my sin still sends off ev evil effects which affect his children. So I need to do something in terms of prayer, charity, and a penance to make sure that I make up for the consequences of my sin. Confession will not do it. If I go to confession, his children will not be satisfied. If I go to confession, it doesn't mean that his children will have shelter or money to go to school. No. So I, need to, I have to do something to abate the evil consequences of my sins, even if the punishment, the guilt of the sin has already been forgiven in confession. So every sin we commit has that aspect to it. The consequences of our sinfulness affect the body of Christ negatively. So in this life, we have to fully amend for the consequences of our sins. How do we do that? The Sermon on the Mount. Prayer, penance, and a charity, which the sermon calls prayer, fasting, and almsgiving. So those three things must be done by a Christian all through one's life. Because of the sins we commit, even if we go to confession, those sins have those evil effects, which continue. Now, by the treasury of the satisfactions Christ offered to the Father, and the satisfactions of the saints, especially Mary, the mother of God, who did not commit any personal sin, but who suffered together with her son, the church can take from that treasury Okay? and apply the effects of those treasures, spiritual treasures, to a particular Christian under the conditions we had here, so that the temporal punishment to sin is removed. Like when a person is dying and they are well prepared, they receive what we call the apostolic pardon, which forgives all temporal punishment due to sin. 
and they go to heaven because that's what the church does and we believe okay so through the action of the church which is the minister of redemption so the church dispenses and applies with authority the authority given to her by christ the treasury of the satisfactions of christ and the saints those are indulgences okay an indulgence is a remission of is a remission before god of the temporal punishment due to sins sins which have already been confessed in the sacrament of penance so we need these treasures of the church they have been abused but doesn't mean they don't exist and they are not good so whenever you hear someone ridiculing church, church teaching on indulgences, know that they are speaking from a position of ignorance. And it's very sad that some of these ignorant people are priests. So they mislead people. So like whenever I go, I'll bring you the prayer okay, during the break. So whenever I go to anoint someone who is about to die, if I can, uh, if they're still your counselors, that's why basically, if you realize that you are ill, call a priest. Okay, don't wait until you know a person can't talk anymore. Yes, if you receive the sacraments, but it's better when a person can participate. When they can go to confession, receive the anointing of the sick, and receive Holy Communion, and then receive the apostolic pardon which I'll read to you when, after the break. So indulgences are very, very important. We continue. An indulgence is partial or plenary according as it removes either part or all of the temporal punishment due to sin. So it can be partial or plenary, meaning partial or complete. The faithful can gain indulgences for themselves or apply them to the dead. So many of us who have dear ones, mothers, fathers, husbands, wives who have died. You know, what, do, what do we do to help them? Oh, they are in heaven. <laughs> we can obtain indulgences for them through the conditions laid here. Okay? So, that is uh, what an indulgence is. And of course, these are the two articles you'll explain in a little bit. But so never listen to anyone who tells you that the indulgences are whatever else is false, because that's basically Luther's position in eh? rejecting all indulgences, this is the sacrament of reconciliation and everything else. Okay. So, so um, in such cases, when they're doing public utility, the true doctrine of indulgences as the remission of the punishment due to sin, not of the guilt of sin, had been always upheld. And the necessary conditions, especially the obligation of a contract confession to obtain absolution from sin, always inculcated. But the alms giving for a good object prescribed only as a good work supplementary to the chief conditions for the gaining of the indulgence was often prominently emphasized. Okay? So the doctrine was never false, falsely taught. But then when it came to giving thanks to God, 